So some time ago, I was really, um, I suppose, in a mood of just deep concern about what was going on, you know, how it, we could be just so cruel to each other. And I saw an interview on what was then a valuable channel, Channel 200. I saw um, an author being interviewed, a man by the name of Tony Wright. He lives in Cornwall and I believe a biologist by training. And he was talking about his book, Left in the Dark, and I can't recommend it enough. And the hypothesis of Tony's book is that we have damage to the left hemisphere, that the left hemisphere is actually a damaged right hemisphere. So, you know, our basic understanding of the, the peace and the serenity and the kindness, if you like to put it that way, the creativity of the right hemisphere and the ability to get it all wrong, basically. Um, the left hemisphere, the side that's overly developed in our education system and all the rest of it. And so what Tony had done, he wanted his left hemisphere to blot out. And he knew that if he deprived himself of sleep for several days, the left hemisphere phases out, it can't hack it. And his experience of his own connection to consciousness was extraordinary. It was just, he said, the most divine experience that he had ever, ever had. And he mentioned this to a group of friends who live in Bristol. And I think it was, I say a group, I don't think there were probably more than three of them. And so they decided they would embark upon the same experience. And uh, so they did it, and okay, there is a collection of numbers, but their experience was even more extraordinary, what they reported. And as it turned out, they were all raw fooders. Now I should hasten to add, I'm not standing here promoting raw fooding, but these people happened to be raw fooders. And so Tony, who hadn't really looked so much at this connection of our being, our connection with consciousness and food, started to look to see how things had changed. And it, it just fits so much in the journey that I seem to have been pushed along, kicking and screaming, I might add at times, because it just so flies in the face of what people are taught. And um, he was seeing that originally the diets we would have been eating beyond hunter-gatherer would have been a diet which would have been raw, obviously, at that stage, and was absolutely loaded with bioflavonoids and carotenoids. And he continued his research and finding the carotenoids. Now, the carotenoids are that beautiful colour that you know in food. And what I should say, Julie, also, something that I've always done and the French have always known, is you take carotenoids before you go in the sun. Because if you travel to the tropics or any hot country, you're blown away by the colour of the fruit. I mean, an avocado in Brazil is bright yellow, the flesh. You have all these oranges, these reds, these yellows. These are for us to deal with this high intensity of light that's coming from the sun. And um, so he knew, absolutely loaded with bioflavonoids, absolutely loaded with carotenoids. And he knew that that gave the most amazing immune system. And he saw the body as being driven, programmed, if you like, by this ama amazing immune system. And he knew that one of the most important things was the third eye because we think of that if we're meditating, but it gets totally separated, it becomes the pineal gland, you know, when we're thinking medically. But he knew that that was so important for the connection of the two hemispheres to be equal and that connection with our own divinity. And uh, 
So his research carried on and he discovered that the carotenoids are responsible for making the melatonin or the third eye making the melatonin. So it's the pineal gland that produces the melatonin. And he knew from that way of eating that we produce masses of melatonin. Now that doesn't put you to sleep, but it puts you into a very different way of being. And he noticed with the way diets had changed, behavior was changing. And instead of having this very strong immune system, we were becoming steroidal, steroidal hormonal, which is what we are now. So the endocrine system doesn't line up. The, the way the, the chemicals are produced in the body. So I found all of this incredibly interesting because of the fascination with the third eye. And certainly from a nutritional point of view and drawing on other things, we know that the pineal gland is hardening in most people. It's calcifying. Now, of course, D3 really does have a huge say in what you do with your calcium, so light. And what I find, um, I suppose I'm allowed to say this, although it's being recorded, the pine cone is the image of the third eye. And if you want to see the two most hardened pine cones in the world, go to the Vatican. They have two sitting there of these stone third eyes in the form of these hard pineal glands. So Tony's work was very, very interesting. The melatonin and the carotenoids. Then I came across something that expanded upon this even more, which I became so excited about, because in studying all of Budwig's work, etc., and looking at the cell, we were getting an understanding of how we store light from outside. And you know, we've always got to remember, as above, so below. But really, what was this mechanism that was going to take place from producing the light from within? And one of my past students was doing a lot of work with a documentary maker where they were filming the creatures in the sea emanating all this light. Now, they were far too deep to be gathering it from the sun, but here they were producing light from within. So this was another thing that got put into the old memory box. And then I came across the final piece of work, which can avoid the LSD that Tim was talking about. There are other ways. <laughs> and this work shows, so if you have an incredibly carotenoid rich diet, then the pineal can produce the melatonin. And the melatonin then produces porphyrins. And it is the porphyrins that produce the light. The highest collection of them is at nerve endings, stem cells, blood, and bone marrow. Now these substances are very, very close in nature to the substances used by people in the Americas for their spiritual practices, for the mind-altering, mind expansion. Now, I'm expressing a totally personal point of view here, but we've got to be able to see the new paradigms. We've got to be able to see them with our eyes, we've got to be able to know. And I really do believe that to see them, get hold of them and use them this vehicle has to change because it is a vehicle, it's an instrument that can get in touch with certain levels. But if we are nurturing it in this way of this very high bioflavonoid, this very high carotenoids to produce the melatonin and to produce the porphyrins, we're into a whole different way of being because I truly, honestly observe that it is light that controls all of the processes. But not only are we needing to trap it from outside, we have to be able to match it from within. So this is extraordinary work, I think, and also bringing the third eye in, 
which I say is always kept as a separate thing. That's for your meditation, that's for your spiritual practices. Now it's within the nutritional picture. And I just find it absolutely blow away. And so you then start to look at this light production and from where, and asking, you know, because there has always been this association with oils, etc., and anointing with oils. But then, no fish makes omega-3. It has to eat it, and it gets it from its food, and particularly from the algae. And you then start to look at the substances that are in those for producing the light, and there are things called bilins, B-I-L-I-N-S, and these can receive a light frequency and store it beyond the light frequency that chlorophyll can store. And so things like marine red algae is absolutely extraordinary at its light. And it's red and it's terribly expensive, needless to say. So we're actually sort of going into where it's dark to see where these creatures are producing all of this light. And they're doing it from these chemicals that are produced from, in the way of plants, it will be the chlorophyll that, and the bilins. But, and again, it's still from plants that we're getting it as well. So it's a whole different way of looking at how the body produces its regulator light. And the next bit is very controversial, what I'm going to share, but I want to share with you everything that's come in front of me because when I was asked to write my second book, I found it very difficult because what was being given to me and presented to me, um, in hard print, I might add, as well, really was really controversial. I was in Bulgaria and the lady who owns the publishing house was asking, could I help? And I knew she lived on coffee and chocolate, so I'm thinking, goodness me, I don't know what I'm going to be able to come up with, you know, that's going to be able to help her. And so I happened to ask the lovely lady who does all the interpretation with me, um, is there much of a following of raw food in Bulgaria? And she said, yes, it's becoming very popular. And of course, they have a very different climate. And so I started to read people who had been raw fooders and it had been absolutely fantastic to begin with, but then had become a problem. They were losing their um, energy, most particularly. And I particularly looked at people who'd worked alongside David Wolfe. And again, you know, absolutely amazing to begin with. And they realized that it was the amount of fat and oil that they were taking in that was causing an issue. Well, of course, he calls himself David Avocado Wolf, and I think he eats about 20 avocados a day, which is crazy. But there is so much. And so started looking at all the work of cardiologists, type 2 diabetes consultants, who were becoming terribly worried about the percentage of calories generated from protein and fats. And it was absolutely blow away looking at this and seeing that unless the liver was absolutely A1, and it is the liver that looks after hydration, the kidneys are simply the filter, but that's the one of the big roles of the liver. And so if the liver was not breaking down the fats and oils, it would find its way into the small intestine, go through the lacteals, into the lymph, and create stagnant lymph. It then drips into the blood with each heartbeat, and people were developing sticky blood, so poor oxygenation. So fat and oil in the diet may be important, I say maybe for a reason, but it has to be adequately processed by the body. And what I would interject here 
is that we have become so used to saying this is fats, this is proteins, and this is carbohydrates. Look at a slice of rye bread and see how much oil there is in it. Look and see how much omega-3 there is in a mango. We've really separated these out so strongly. And then the universe, as I say, has always been so kind. People were coming to me and telling me all sorts of stories. Well, what I realized, of course, with raw food is, is they don't heat fat and oil. And I have to say at this point in my journey, I would say that I do not believe anybody's body knows really quite what to do with heated fats and oils. You know, even if we're using coconut or animal fat, if you're, you're giving it a job. You're giving it a job and a half. And so if we're talking about healing, you want to sleep, release as much energy as possible. So we should be very conscious that we're going to heat. And you know, it's been put into so many things. I mean, hummus traditionally does not have olive oil in it. Stir fry in the East is not done with oil. It's done with a bit of water and a splash of soy sauce. The oils have been added all over the place. So within my practice, for a time of asking people to be extremely conscious, A, about heated fats and oils, even knowing the right kind, and all the added. Because, you know, it's so common for people to come to me who keep a bag of walnuts in their pocket and a bag of seeds and raisins and are consuming all of this dormant food. It's next year's crop. It's enzymically terribly demanding. Nuts and seeds should always be soaked. And I may add, sadly, that unless they sprout, you don't know whether they've been irradiated. Because all of those that have come through China, etc., have been irradiated. So they really are so concentrated. And then, of course, it got worse, the story, my resistance to getting on with this book. And a close friend of mine, a Hungarian friend, who is trained and steeped in true anthroposophy, sent me, and I'll give you the particulars of it, sent me, said, well, just to really put you in turmoil, read this paragraph. Now, you can get this off the internet. It's in Rudolf Steiner Archives, and it's called Problems of Nutrition. It's a bit of strange translation. And it's a lecture by Steiner given in Munich, January the 8th, 1909. Now Steiner never told us anything we should or shouldn't do. He would simply present the information. Now if I was being, you know, I was really aspiring to think what I feel nutrition is about. I actually feel nutrition should serve to integrate all of the levels of a human being into the physical body for us to work with. This is to me what grounding means. You know, when a baby is born in the presence of an anthropop, they stay with them to massage the subtle bodies and don't go away until they've massaged the subtle bodies into the baby. It may take several hours. And so, yes, I, you know, a facilitator to awaken inner wisdom, but more importantly, to integrate what we view as spiritual and energy bodies and subtle bodies within the everyday physical. So let me just read you a paragraph of this lecture. The right kind of inner flexibility offers the foundation for the right solution of the nutritional problem. This statement points to the fact that all internal process, processes that man must execute must be carried on in the opposite direction from the processes of plants. When man eats vegetarian food, and you know, he didn't live in the bag of nuts and seeds time, it demands a great deal of his organism. Plant food does not contain much fat. The human organism, which is able to produce fats, is thus required to produce fat from something that in, it, that in itself contains no fat. In other words, when a man eats vegetarian food, he must produce an activity within himself and make an inner effort to bring about the production of fats. He spared this task when he eats ready-made animal fats. 
The materialist would probably say this is an advantageous thing for a man to store up as much fat as possible without, without having to make too much of an effort. Yet, speaking from the spiritual viewpoint, the unfolding of this inner activity signifies the unfolding of the actual inner life. When man is forced to produce the forces that make it possible for him to produce fat on his own, then through his inner flexibility, the ego and the astral body become master of the physical and etheric bodies. When man eats fat, he result resultingly is spared the task of producing fat for himself. Yet, if he takes the opportunity to unfold his own inner activity through producing his own fat, he is made free and thus becomes lord over his body. Otherwise, as a spiritual being, he remains a mere spectator. I was kind of blown away by this because, you know, I have seen so many people struggling because they've got fats and oils in their diet. And n nobody's going to eat fat free. It's, you know, it wouldn't be humanly possible unless, you know, people who are going on juice fast, that sort of thing. And here then people started to present themselves telling me stories. I'll just tell you the most recent one. A lovely French lady with multiple sclerosis. And remember at the beginning of talking today, I was mentioning that cancer and MS have this really bizarre Curlian light picture. And uh, we were sharing and, you know, she was saying that the important thing for her was the integration of the spiritual in the physical way of being. And she'd been on a long journey having this chronic condition. And she had suffered for a long, long time a urinary tract infection and the powers that be had given her antibiotic cover for many years and she just could not be doing with this. And so she sought out a Dr. Morse, I don't know whether anybody knows him, he's a herbalist <coughs> and a naturopath. And he said to her, what you need to do, he said is I have absolutely no fat and oil and he named how many weeks and just to have fruit. She says she's never had a urinary tract infection. So, so it blows. There are no rules. You know, we can say, we can say sugar feeds cancer. I would challenge that and say it will if the cellular setup is wrong. I won't dis disturb. But you know how I was saying you need to have the electrons, the photons and the oxygen coming in. So we can't possibly separate one thing as the cause or whatever it's doing. But we can talk about light looking, you know, and controlling all of these things. And just people just have come and come and come um, with issues. And also, I then started to see a lot of people with, I'll just say, chronic illness for this purpose, who had been put on the Budwig protocol, which is loads of oil and their markers had gone sky high, which was a, sh a total indication that when the liver becomes stagnant, it, the body just dumps it. It just puts it wherever it will. But it was such um, um, a difficult one to integrate, you know, and having written my first book and having had all Budwig's books translated into English and understanding that. But then there was this moment when I stopped and I thought, well, fine. They're talking about light from outside. We must talk about light produced from within because it is a total reflection. And these little creatures under the sea, deep in the ocean, producing all of this light made one really question. And then, you know, this integration of the things that are considered to be spiritual, like the third eye, all of these things should not be separated out. And just like Steiner is talking about the astral and the ego becoming lorded master over the etheric and the physical. And he goes on, in, if you read more of his nutritional things, that the body has to have inner flexibility. Because he said, you know, anything that's outside is alien. And he talks about creating warmth ether, this subtle energy 
that is used for this transformation of the food outside the body to be utilized in this inner flexibility. And therefore talking about developing this other way of being. So that was also important because I'd always associated oil with light, electrons, photons, and all of this. But suddenly we're seeing the importance of the colored things, the things that are really there in the tropics, etc. You know, the carotenoids, they're everywhere, but they are so full there. And this, I'm, I'll confess to some level of irritation because if I'm sitting in a large group where people are discussing cancer, there's always going to be some character who pipes up and says, but Gerson was using all that carrot and apple. It's far too sweet. And because I have a great love of Gerson, because I think he was such an amazing person, um, his breakthrough, I thought, you know, there's something more this guy knows. I'm absolutely convinced. Well, of course, it's laden with carotenoids. So once we understand carotenoids, melatonin, porphyrins, bilins, light, and mind expansion, awareness expansion, my goodness, do we need it? You know, we've been talking about closed mind, but, you know, it's beyond the mind if we're going to see the solutions. Of course we can't do it from the same base that we're being created. And I do feel we're just in that absolute thing. Because so many people come to me with deeply chronic situations, I have such a desperate impatience because, you know, there is the collection of alternative things, but to me it was always missing, always missing this understanding. What is this vital element? And I'm absolutely convinced it's light. But the fact that these porphyrins are so like these things used in shamanic practices, in spiritual practices, for people to get in touch with that part of themselves that they feel they've lost connection with. And to do it within the whole physiology and biochemistry of the body. So I found it incredibly exciting. And the fact that the body can produce an awful lot more than we've ever been allowed to think. Just going back to bioflavonoids, years ago I met somebody who was considered eccentric by most but really knew a thing or two and particularly with chronic illness and he was deeply of the opinion that it is the bioflavonoid component of vitamin C that does the work and here we've got this coming up, the high bioflavonoid carotenoid combination which of course you get from all the fruits and vegetables, particularly on the, depending on the color. All green has carotenoid. It not only has the chlorophyll, but it has the carotenoids there. So the deeper the green, the more carotenoids <coughs> there are there. So it really gives us a sort of background understanding that it isn't just about changing body pH. It isn't just about all of those things. It really is talking about expanded guidance, expanded awareness, expanded wisdom. And we kind of know when things are there, you know. And as I say, that's the journey which I wanted to share with you that the second book took me on. And I found it very, very difficult because it hasn't got about the end part with the carotenoids and that. But, um, you know, Tony Wright really put into perspective really behavioural nutrition. I mean, years ago, I remember reading Diet, Crime and Delinquency, which really was very basic, where, um, I even forget his name, I think it was Schaus, a doctor in the States persuaded a certain number of judges to give nutritional sentences <laughs> rather than custodial sentences, and the effect was amazing. And then they came over here and did something called brass tacks with the police. Again, big, big influence in the prisons of behavior, etc. But if one thinks of moving it to this level of awakening, I just think it's amazing what might happen, that sort of expansion of seeing. Because, you know, we, we keep talking about 
raising of the vibration, quietening the noise in the body, being in touch. I think it's the old paradigms, personally. I don't think they're new at all. But now people are beginning to marry the two together. And that, I think, is so exciting. Thank you. Thank you.